What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for Sports. So, I actually saw this article late last night, but I decided to talk about it today. But I see that the mainstream sports media outlets have picked up on it. Undisputed was talking about it. So, Rich Paul, LeBron James's agent, was more or less just saying that he believes that LeBron James had just as hard a path, if not a harder path, than Michael Jordan to greatness, I guess, more or less, whatever that term means. Um, you know, I, I guess he was saying that LeBron faced greater expectations. You know, he had greater expectations and, um, you know, also LeBron didn't try to mimic Jordan. He was his own player. And his style and all of this, his game, which to me feels like a little bit of a shot at Kobe. But then again, Rich Paul is a scumbag fuck anyway. So this is my take on this, all right? <clears throat> I'm going to try to be as condensed as possible, but I really need to be detailed. So bear with me here. Because I think it's in different layers. If you're talking about the expectations expected of each player when they were first drafted, then I would say, yeah, LeBron had more pressure on him when he was first drafted, okay? LeBron James was having his high school games aired on ESPN. We had never seen that before. A high school kid having his games aired on television. You know, constant uh, hype from grown ass men who are uh, sports analysts talking about how great this guy potentially can be. Um, you know, talking about how, you know, uh, you, you know he's a man. He's a man amongst boys, and blah 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 blah. And how much money he might be able to accumulate in his career, and he's the next big thing. And um, he was picked first overall. He was 18 years old, and um, he was expected to turn around a franchise that had been rather poor. For several seasons at that time. He also got the benefit of playing pretty much essentially for his hometown. He was from Akron, Ohio. He was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers. Michael Jordan was a really good player in college, but he was drafted third behind, behind Akeem Olajuwon and, and Sam Bowie. Now, what I will say about that is, people have to remember that at that time, the prevailing wisdom about building a championship team was that you built around a center. Now, Akeem Olajuwon, an all-time great center, a top 10 player in my book, had Houston ties. He played for University of Houston. He used to practice and scrimmage with Moses Malone when Moses Malone was with the Houston Rockets. By that time, Moses Malone was with Philly, but you know the Houston Rockets had, uh, excuse me, had uh, Ralph Sampson. They wanted to build twin towers, so it made sense that they would draft Akeem Olajuwon first. Now with Sam Bowie in Portland, people have to remember. Portland had already drafted Clyde Drexler the year before. So they felt like they didn't need a center. I mean, excuse me, a shooting guard. They needed a center. So they drafted Sam Bowie. Even though Michael Jordan's Olympic coach uh, told Portland, the Portland general manager, draft Michael Jordan any fucking way. I've seen this guy. He's on another fucking level. But anyway, 
when it comes to earlier expectations, people thought Mike was going to be maybe like a Michael Finley, uh, Jerry Stackhouse type player, right? So when it comes to earlier expectations and, and pressures, yes, I would give LeBron more pressure early on. No doubt about it. Over time, however, things change. Now, I heard Shannon Sharp say something about, well, LeBron was having to deal with jealousy, signed that $90 million contract, and all these endorsements. A lot of his peers were jealous of him. Well, let's not forget that Michael Jordan clearly, clearly blossomed as a Chicago Bull early on in his rookie year. Michael didn't have a career like Scotty where it took him several years to develop. No, almost from the get-go, Michael Jordan dominated in the NBA. And Michael had to deal with jealousy, obviously, from guys like George Gervin, guys like Isaiah Thomas, you know, some other players who were rumored to have not been too fond of Mike. Mike was getting shoe deals, which was unheard of at the time. So Michael had to deal with jealousy as well. He was frozen out in the 85 uh, All-Star game. You know? So, yeah. Jordan had to deal with jealousy as well. But this is where things begin to change. For LeBron James, <clears throat> everybody talks about how he went to the finals when he was 22 years old. Oh, yeah, 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 right. But that Piston team that he that he led to uh, an upset against, that wasn't the same team that Shannon's talking about. He's talking about, what, three years earlier, that team upset the Lakers. Well, they did. <clears throat> that team was starting to lose its edge. Ben Wallace was no longer with that team at the time. And you could tell that team was nearing the end of its run. The Pacers, who were a really good team when LeBron was drafted, they had been dismantled due to the, the malice at the Palace. Reggie Miller was retired by then. And that New Jersey Nets team with Jason Kidd and, you know, all those, you know, that team was pretty much near the end of its run. The Eastern Conference was more or less extremely weak, which led the path for a Cleveland Cavaliers team to go to a finals. But they were swept any fucking way, even though Tim Duncan played like shit in that finals. They were still swept. Um, and no, LeBron did not play with a bunch of bums. I would argue the 2007 Cavaliers overall had more talent than the 87 Bulls. I would argue that. Or even the 88 Bulls when Pippen and, and Grant were rookies. I would argue that they had more talent. If you really look at that fucking roster. But anyway, you contrast that with Michael Jordan, <clears throat> who clearly was becoming this phenomenal player who nobody, he was, he was he was the best player in the NBA, even though a lot of people still were hanging on the Magic and Larry. But in the Eastern Conference, he had a lot more competition. He had to deal with Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics, who was still a great team, the Detroit Pistons, who were right on the cusp of becoming a championship team. They had to deal with the up-and-coming Dominique Wilkins and, you know, the, the Atlanta Hawks. So what are you talking about? Reggie Miller, Chuck Pearson, uh, Chuck Person, uh, Rick Smits, and the Indiana Pacers. Or whether you're talking about uh, Patrick Ewing and New York Knicks and Mark Jackson and Kiki Vandeweghe and that team, you know. So there was more, or the, the Cleveland Cavaliers. People forget the Cavaliers were supposed to be the team in the 1990s. In 1989, their regular season, 88-89, Cleveland beat Chicago 6-0 in the regular season. They were supposed to be a team in the future. The Bulls were being looked at as Michael and the Jordan Ayers, You know, He's a really good player, but they'll never win because Michael's a selfish scorer and scoring champions don't win titles. That was the prevailing notion. 
That's what people said. And I also disagree with something else Shannon says. He says that LeBron was always chasing Mike, but Mike wasn't chasing anything. That's bullshit. That's a fucking lie. Michael Jordan was always chasing Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. And anybody, even a person who hates Michael Jordan, will tell you that's the fucking truth. He was always chasing Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. They were the standards for championships. They were the unselfish players. They were the ones who got teammates around him better. Michael was the guy that only cared about scoring. Michael was only caring about scoring titles. Michael was too selfish to win. That was the fucking narrative. So don't sit back like Michael didn't have any criticisms back then. That's bullshit. As a matter of fact, I would argue that from 2003 to 2010, LeBron James, outside of Skip Bayless, had more favorable press uh, coverage overall than Michael Jordan did before he started winning championships. They were talking about how selfish he was, and you know, outside the city of Chicago, how selfish he was, and you know, uh, he's not going to win a championship playing the way he plays. Um. You know, all the great players, you know, they got their teammates involved. And, you know, only the only scoring champions to win titles were like, you know, big men. And you got to build around a big man to win a title. You, you, you can't have a 6'6 guard shooting all these shots. And Michael won't change and augment his game. I remember it. <clears throat> then if you go to the 2010s, LeBron had an easy path to the finals virtually every fucking year. I mean, who was his competition? The Pacers with Paul George? Uh, the Toronto Raptors with DeMar DeRozan? And not this version of DeMar DeRozan. The DeMar DeRozan always choked. That was it. That that was the competition. <laughs> that was the competition. Whereas when Jordan did his thing in the 90s, he had to go up against a great New York Knicks team and arguably the greatest perimeter, def uh, perimeter def defense in the history of the NBA in 1992. He was still going up against the bad boy Pistons in the early 90s. The Cleveland Cavaliers, Miami Heat with uh, Tim Hardaway or Alonzo Mourning, the best Pacers team ever, in my opinion, 98. Even though they didn't go to the finals, the 98 team was better than the 2000 team. Or whether you're talking about, you know, Grant Hill and the Detroit Pistons or Atlanta Hawks team with uh, Matumbo, Steve Smith, and uh, Mookie Blaylock. Uh, I mean, it was it was a lot of more competition in the Eastern Conference in the nineties. That you know that was at least giving the Bulls a run for their money. The Bulls were still the best team, and yes, the Bulls were winning you know sixty, seventy games in the late nineties. But you also got to remember that in 1997, the Miami Heat won 61 games. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? The Pacers in 1998 won 58 games. The Orlando Magic, who just slipped my fucking mind, they were supposed to be a team of the future. They won 60, 60 games in 1996. You know, and that still is the best Orlando Magic team in the history of that franchise. That's another thing. People keep saying that Michael didn't play anybody, but the best Houston Jazz team came under Michael's watch. The best Sonics team, record-wise at least, came under Michael's watch. 64 win Sonics. One of the greatest defensive teams in the history of the NBA. You know what I'm saying? Uh, one of the best Phoenix team, Phoenix Suns team, uh, Phoenix Suns teams 
if not the best, the 93 Phoenix Suns. Portland in 1992 won, I think, 61 games. So it's like this notion that Mike played against bad competition makes no sense at all. And he played against stars. Whether you talking about Magic Johnson, James Worthy, Clyde Drexler, Charles Barkley, Kevin Johnson, Gary Payton, Sean Kemp, Sean, uh, you know, uh, uh, John Stockton, Carl Malone. It's not like he didn't play against any stars. And he also didn't have anything abridged or cheated to help him in the finals. LeBron conspired with Brian Windhorse to have Draymond Green suspended for game five. Now, the injury to Bogut, that's out of his reach. He didn't know a thing about that was going to happen. But he conspired to have Draymond Green and succeeded in having him sus suspended for game five. Now, I don't really have much to say to defend Draymond Green, but you have to admit he was playing the best basketball of his life at that time. Not to mention the fact that there's this fallacy going around that this Warriors team is the best team of all time. They're the best team of all time, right? And people make make up, you know, make so much about Cleveland coming back from this 3-1 deficit. Do people forget that the Thunder had them down 3-1? And if the Thunder had better coaching or a more capable point guard, they would have won their fucking uh, series and upset them. And if the Warriors are such a great team, why did they feel the need that they had to upgrade and get Kevin Durant? Not to mention the fact also that Mike stayed with the same organization through thick and thin. LeBron was ran out of Cleveland. He quit. Detroit was a hell of a fucking team, and they pound and beat on Michael Jordan nearly into submission. Nearly. But Mike stayed and ultimately won a championship. With his only real superstar, uh, all star teammate, excuse me, being Scottie Pippen. LeBron. Dipped on his team. He quit. They made him quit. That's why Paul Pierce, in my opinion, does not have all that utmost respect for LeBron because he saw him quit and go join a super team and continue to create super teams for the next decade. From June of 2010 to recently, LeBron's teams have been involved in over 70 fucking trades. Over 70. But it was harder for LeBron, though, right? It was harder. It was harder. You know how much easier it could have been if it was acceptable for Jordan to say, hey, you know, uh, hey, Scotty, I think, you know, we should go out to Charles. You know, he's disgruntled. Let's go get Charles Barkley and have him join us next year. I, mean, I think that's a good idea, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, go talk to, go talk to Jerry Cross about that. You know, I don't like that fat motherfucker. Hey, hey, yeah, you know, Sean Kemp, man. He's, a, he's disgruntled, man. Let's go get Sean, man. Matter of fact, man, let's go get Shaq. Let's go get Shaq, man. Yeah, that'd be easy. But can you imagine Shaq, Pippen, and Jordan on the same fucking team? Would they fucking lose? But, you know, it is what it is, y'all. It is what it is, man. End of the day, this is bullshit. More talk. More bullshit. LeBron chose to wear number 23. LeBron chose to steal Mike's uh, routine with the chalk. But he running away from Mike. Yeah, all right. Yeah.